Namaste and in La Ketch. Hi, I'm Zen Benefiel and welcome to this edition of One World in a New World. And as I've said before numerous times, Namaste and in La Ketch are a couple of ancient greetings that we need to pay heed to today because Namaste means the divine in me recognizes the divine in you and in La Ketch means I am another you. And that's both from the uh, Hindu and the Mayan. So They've got a few things on us we can apply today. So this week's episode is with Robert Butchwin. He is a success uh, business strategy and networking mentor. Um, I'd say when I looked at his LinkedIn profile, I saw 30,000 connections. I'm like, oh my God, this guy is just hugely busy. Um, he's got a company called Success Strategist. And for 20 years, he's been in the upper 10th of 1% income in his profession. And he was elected to the Multi-Level uh, Marketing International Association Hall of Fame. So the guy's got, actually knows what's going on and talking to people and, and getting things done. He's a contributing writer to industry per periodicals and he wrote a best-selling book called Street Smart Networketing. Networketing, right, easy yes. for me to say. Robert, welcome to the show. And on that note, you know, I am really glad to be here and being able to share some insight, wisdom, life experiences, wherever we might go today. Well, great. And we'll just jump in with that. You know, in uh, and being who you are and doing what you do, this has to have taken a lot of um, internal growth and personal growth and, and the process of that uh, in order to achieve what you've been able to achieve. That's just part of the natural process, right? So what, how did you first notice what was these changes and, and your, uh, your noticing of the questions and, and the things that prompted you to move in that direction? It was through a life experience. And, and let me take you way back. You know, I grew up in our family business. Are we joining with Peabody and Sherman? Uh, pretty, right. pretty close to that far back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> But, you know, I grew up in our family business, so I always expected a third generation, oldest son, expected to run that business. Mm -hmm. So, and, and I will admit the fact that as I was going through my formal education, I took the path of least resistance. I didn't necessarily study at the level I should have back then because I figured my course in life was pretty well set. But then I had an awakening. Actually, I had two different awakenings. The first awakening happened because I was covering an area in the uh, family business and I increased the sales like a half a million dollars in one year from where it was the previous year. So that had to do with yeah. market penetration? It had to do with a couple of different things. We started the high school ward cheerleading jacket business in the 1930s. Okay. You know, it, it, the leather sleeves, those kind of things. And so... Um, First of all, I, did, I uncovered an error in our um, model, pricing model, as far as um, determining the price. So we became a little more competitive. And then I also helped design the jacket. And I also understand the whole concept of selling. But, you know, where that went is my grandmother was still running it, so to speak, running the business, even though my dad was running the business. She was never there. But well, yeah, we, we have to have a matriarch. Yeah. Exactly. And we had grandkids in the business. And so she wanted to make sure all the grandkids were making making approximately the same amount of money. So that was my first awakening. I, you know, I went to my dad. I said, there's something wrong with this picture. I know what I'm doing. It's not. So I became frustrated with where I was. And so somehow I had a synchronistic event approximately that same, same amount period of time. And I came across a Wayne Dyer cassette tape series. Wonderful and, man. Yeah. And it was called No Limit Person. And see, the reason that became my awakening is because I started to come to the understanding that you need to take responsibility for what is, no matter what's going on in your life, if you want to take it for what will be. But see, absolutely. It, it is. And the what is, it's a very Zen thing. But you've got to recognize that. Yes. It, you got to, yeah. And see, most people, regardless just, of the label you put on it, right? Yeah. Exactly. But most people are in a state of denial. And I love the acronym of denial, which is don't even notice I am lying. And you're lying to yourself 
by not taking responsibility for the what is. And so that was my other awakening. And, you know, from there, my journey really started. That's a great point. And, and speaking of points, you know, that's kind of the finger pointing when you're not taking responsibility, you're looking for other places to point to, to, to give responsibility. And one of the things that my dad shared with me when I was young, he said, be careful of these three because they're pointing back at you, <laughs> right? And so you, ought, you better have three solutions in hand or don't point the finger. Yep, exactly. And, and talking about, and that brings up a very interesting point because one of the guys I met when, when I've been networking is a guy named James Feldman. And we always hear about this out of the box kind of thinking. Mm -hmm. And he says, no, you've got to get into the box. You've got to get into the problem and you need 3D thinking, which well, I'd offer this too, because I agree with that. Yeah. But being outside the box, you get a chance to read the labels. Yes. Then dive back in because then you know what's inside the box. Right. That's exactly it. And the 3D thinking is the depth of the problem, the distance to the solution and the determination to solve it. Right. So anyhow, that was, I thought that was appropriate relationship to what we were just talking about. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. The, the changes in, in the attitude and accepting the responsibility of your choices is imperative in any kind of self-awareness and, and self-development process. Yes. So at that point, I had to do catch up work mm -hmm. i had to figure out how could i create the skill set that would allow me to create the kind of results i mean i had the self-confidence in who i was but i also recognized my shortcomings sure and so i started pouring personal growth kind of information into my mind um you know wherever i drove around in the twin cities whenever i was in a car i turned it into a university whenever i had time to read a book. I was out searching for different perspectives that would allow me to create the kind of success that I knew that I was destined for. I didn't know what it, exactly what it was going to look like, right? but I knew that I wanted to make a difference in the world. One of the things that I came to the realization through everything that I've experienced is we all have two B days, a birthday and a box in a uh, box day and in between there's a dash and it's like how can you live on once your time on this planet expires and so i wanted to know that i could make a difference with the people that i came in contact with sure. wherever i could and that happens in, in just daily activity right you know this um and it's kind of for me anyway we think that we've got to look at the horizon and create something that we're working towards and, and everything's happening right in front of us. You know, the people you meet, you smile, you greet them, you interact with them. You never know what's going to happen, right? But if you ignore them and, and you constantly, you know, are looking away or, or not trying to make eye contact, then you're really diminishing your own possibilities. You hit two really key points the eye contact and that was one of my secret sauces back when we were doing a lot more networking in person mm -hmm. eye contact and a smile and then you talk about meeting people and you know early on i learned about self-talk and when people say how are you doing you know and if you ask a lot of people how are you doing most people are going to respond good okay I always like to say phenomenal, whatever, I'm fantastic. You know, I mean, awesome and getting better. Right? Yes, yeah, <laughs> constantly getting better. Life is yeah, yeah. better, you know, uh, because again, we program ourselves based on the things that we say and the things that we put in our mind in our activities. Totally agree with that, and and I'm living proof, and as I'm sure you are too. And when you begin applying these things, you'll be your own proof, right? If you're listening to this. The interesting thing I find, too, is that it, it it's determined by your attention, intention, and resulting interaction. A hundred percent, you know, you're, you hit the nail, so to speak, the nail on the head. Sure. You know, and, Softly, I hope. Yeah, <laughs> softly, of course. You know, and 
one of the, my mentors along the way, who's no longer on the planet, unfortunately, had an early demise, Brian Clemmer. And he had an exercise about your intention. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we all have good intentions. I mean, think about, you know, for example, if you started a diet or, you know, whatever it is that you might have started, you know, when obviously when you start certain things, your intention is to be successful. But Absolutely. usually yeah. something stops you along the way. And he would do an exercise in the different events that I went to that he did. A good friend, I, you know, been on stage with him many times, but he'd get everybody on one side of the road. And he picked on somebody, whoever, and he said, now your objective is to go from this side of the room to that. He'd ask the person, now are you clear on your intention? And the person said, yes. So he says, okay, start walking. So as he got halfway across the room, he'd yell out at the top of his lungs, stop. And every time he did that, the person that I watched, and it was always different people, would stop. But you're talking about the intention. He had the clarity, and sometimes quite often, something stop, happens to stop most people. Right. Yeah. So and it's unfortunate, but it's usually because they give their attention to something other than their mission. You know, yes. we call that, a, a friend of mine uh, calls that the law of distraction and interruption. <laughs> you know, it, ama it amazes me, but it doesn't amaze me that you use the word distraction because that was exactly what, what I was thinking about before you said that. Yeah, well, you know, sometimes there's some empathic listening going on here, right? Um, it's really wonderful when we recognize that we do have the ability to make the choices. And as you've mentioned, you know, you've been able to ascertain the, the reasons or at least the majority of them, of the distractions, the whys of why those, those come in, and then the, the counter of, oh, okay, well, that's not really true now, is it? And <laughs> moving through with the determination and, and, and dedication. It uh, reminds me of the five Ps, you know, patience, persistence, uh, perseverance, passion, and purpose. Mm -hmm. There's still a, a sixth one involved that we don't think about, and that's practice. Yep. Yeah, consistently, you know, practice what you're doing because obviously, when you're whatever you're doing, you if you're paying attention to it, which was what, mm -hmm. you, what you said earlier, you're getting different results. And, and it, even, for example, when a negative thing happens, and early on, I think I listened to Dr. Robert Anthony Beyond Positive Th Beyond Positive Thinking. He talked about you know, we all have certain lessons we're supposed to learn. And until we learn those lessons, life will continually trip you up in lesson. How does that relate to the things that we do? It's like any time I have an experience, and one of my other mentors used to say, experience is what you get when you don't get what you want. So I take a look at my experiences and I say, what was the lesson that I was supposed to get? How is this going to benefit me? But unfortunately, based on how many people will look at an experience, they say that validates my lack of not being worthy. I take a look at it as this is just a stepping stone to make sure that I'm going to accomplish to arrive wherever I'm supposed to arrive, no matter what it is. It's Precisely. like, what did I learn from this? Right. And in, in life, you know, for me, I see it just as an experience and, and the ability to craft. Uh, well, Dudley Lynch called me a possibilities coagulator years ago. And, you know, life's full of possibilities. It's just how do we bring them together and how do we think and interact and with the, the notion now of, of how science and, and uh, metaphysics and spirituality and, and leadership are all basically saying the same thing that we create or co-create our reality through that attention, intention and interaction. Yep. And even quantum physics, you know, is bringing that into a relative state of being, right? Um, so you mentioned the, the, the negative stuff. But if we could go, you know, step into that Wayback Machine again for just a moment. What was the toughest thing that, that you had to address in yourself? And what were the indicators that drew it to your attention? Well... It goes back to when I came to the realization, as far as myself, where I short term my education. I got a degree, but I didn't really 
gain an education. I got life experiences because I've always been active. You mm-hmm. know, I mean, as far back, I think, you know, people ask me, I, I believe I'm a serial entrepreneur as far back as I can remember everything from delivering papers to cutting grass, to shoveling snow, growing up in Minnesota, to caddying at the golf course, to I was a singing waiter at Farrell's Ice Cream Parlor, for those of you that might remember that. Remember um, yeah. So, yeah, before I got into our family business, and then when I was trying to get out of our family business, I ended up running a nightclub where the owners had sabotaged it, and I brought it back to the top nightclub before I got married. Obviously, I would never gotten married if I was still running a nightclub, but that's a whole yeah, other story. Um, so as, as that relates, you know, once I came to the realization that – I, you know, was responsible for everything that was going on and that sort of like, again, was a defining moment in my life. And it sort of like carried me through to this day because recently, um, actually it was about seven, eight years ago, one of my, one of the people that I thought was a good friend basically stabbed me in the back and stole a lot of my resources, my assets. And so I've had to reinvent myself and you know the you take a look at what's going on in the marketplace it's changed like for example you know um i think it was 57 58 years ago a distant cousin of mine wrote a song in the title of the song the answer my friend is blowing in the wind well 57 eight years ago the answers might have been in the winds today they're on the internet i mean right. all you have to do is all you have to do is ask google or siri or alexa you know, whatever you want to know, and it's right there. So again, it's taking a look at that event and realizing how that's really helping you, not hindering you, whatever that might be. Those moments are precious once we, you know, they're not so precious in the midst. Yes. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Because they feel like you're on all kinds of of, the... spins and twirls and the emotional roller coasters that come along with it as far as how you're interacting with yourself. It really has nothing to do with the outer world at that point. Your activity does for sure. Yes. It's that inner uh, strife and turmoil and, and recognition and, and uh, coming of age, so to speak, that brings us in into that um, awareness that we do. And, and, or we can affect the outer world positively for us and for others when that attitude shift takes place. Now, you mentioned today in the, the marketplace, wow, um, the, the shift in, especially with r- remote workers, mm-hmm. uh, there's a whole new realm that's opening up because now these guys realizing, oh, I don't have to work in a building. I can w- work at home. I'm, I can get paid the same, maybe even a little bit more. And that gives me the opportunity to choose where I want to live. So there's a new wave of regenerative community building that's taking place. Where there's, right, there's communities taking, uh, they're building it all around uh, a greater experience of nature and co-living, co-working space and, and things that really support a holistic lifestyle, which for me, that's mind, body, spirit, and earth. Mm-hmm. We often forget that she's the most important thing. Without her, we ain't nothing. <laughs> and so then all of this is helping, in my opinion, to uh, boost this shift of consciousness where we're in, uh, like my good friend Swami Beyond Ananda calls it, we're in the great we set. Because we're recognizing it doesn't matter which camp you're in, we still have to learn to work together. Definitely, you know, and one of the keys that in relationship, and I hundred percent, a thousand percent agree with everything that you say that you're saying. But it's relationships. You know, yeah. you've probably heard the saying, you know, your net worth is in direct re- relationship to the value of your network. Right. Um, and it's all about relationships. It's easier to create relationships if you can break through the noise, be authentic and be of value, not coming across with somebody with commission breath or just to do a transaction. Sure. You know, get outside of the short term and focus on the long term of relationship. And if you focus on that, and um, there's so many different places now 
compared to where there was to develop high quality relationships. I mean, as a networker, I've um, compiled a list of over 30 different networking Zoom calls. Then you've got Clubhouse, but you know, an expression I learned in Asia, same, same, but different. There's right. similarities, but you know, everything that you talk about to me, part of the foundation is the quality of relationships that you have. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it, it's, you know, in the sound clip world, um, something came out of my mouth that that's some time ago is we're all in relationships on the ocean of emotion, seeking yep. safe Harbor. Right. And so in that process, then we're looking at building this, these, uh, supportive, strengthening, um, acknowledging, even admiring, you know, relationships, uh, even though every interaction is a transaction, right? Because there's give and take and, and there's in the flow, there's not a push and a pull to that, which is a distinction I think that is especially prevalent now in the 21st century as opposed to the 20th century, where everything was a push and a pull. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Right? So now there's this, um, let me ask you this question. How have you noticed that exchange um, transforming in the last decade or so? And especially now coming out of COVID. Well, coming out, I don't think we're out yet. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, no, I, we're, yeah. we're still in the midst of it, but yeah. we've got over that first hump of yeah. the global sequestration, right? <laughs> don't go outside, be afraid of everybody. And, and right. Gosh. Again, I'm not afraid. I mean, I'm obviously taking precautions, but you know, you talked about holistic and part of where I'm coming from, because, you know, I remember back probably 40, 50 years ago, I talked to holistic and then we'll get back to the other, you know, I was watching 60 minutes and they talk about this a guy was on there talking that he worked for a food company. He said, my job is to make products addictive, you know, not necessarily good for you, but addictive, you know, the lace uh, potato chip, it can't, you can't eat right. one. So yeah. back to your, you know, what you're talking about, you know, we've got to be the leaders. We've got to show by example, you know, um, I like to, I like to, you know, give to other people. You know, when I first communicate, when I start any kind of conversation, my first question or statement is, how can I be of value to you? Because I know that there's something that I've got, be it, I've either got some insights from my you know, life experiences, I can guide them to resources, or I can make a connection if I connect with them and I feel it's the right connection. Sure. So I've always got something that I can make a positive difference. So I think people like yourself, like myself, that are living it by example and helping people understand this is a better way. You know, yes, we all want the transactions. Transactions will happen ultimately if you show that you're value and that you're empathetic and that they're empty without the relationship yes. on a sensory level yes you know, they're they're void and like um t harv Eker says you know what you do anywhere you do everywhere so the yeah. patterns that you establish whether you recognize it or not you're going to be doing it everywhere so one of the things how did you first learn to observe yourself Probably it started off by observing other people and, and figuring out, mm -hmm. you know, and you mentioned T. Harv Eckert. I actually spoke on stage with T. Harv Eckert before he was T. Harv Eckert. It was Street Smart Business School back in San Diego when he was first starting off. But uh -huh. um, how do I observe myself? I mean, uh, recently I've gotten a lot more into meditation and going inside. Um, but I think it started by watching other people, being aware, of understanding my intuitiveness. And I look at myself as being very intuitive and I can usually read right through other people. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just being aware and uh, empathetic and understanding. You know, it's like sometimes somebody has what they call a bad hair day. And I know you and I don't have a lot of hair, but you yeah. know. <laughs> <laughs> but we Get still got on that one for sure. <laughs> well, this is my new look. I, I like my cap. You know, <laughs> I, I have multiple. I, I call myself a mini hat man. 
Yeah. Um, and for multiple reasons, right? So it, it's, um, it, it's interesting that uh, in the process, you know, of, of, I agree, I, that's a similar process for me. I was observing others and looking at, you know, how I felt about their behavior um and you know would i do something similar what would be better or you know all those kinds of things and then uh gosh it was just a few years ago um now i'm like you know, I, I have great empathy i've been an empath since i was a kid didn't really understand what all that was about until later because it, it you know there was, wasn't anybody around to explain why i felt the way i felt and in uh, the last few years there was uh introduction of uh, indigenous philosophy, the ancient one. Um, it's called the three brain philosophy. Mm -hmm. And they start with the first brain, which is not the one on top of your head or on top of your shoulders. It's the one in your gut. Yep. And the gut is where all the vibrations are felt by the body. There's even uh, now medically it's been proven there's a lot of neurocircuitry uh, receptors there as well as in the heart so the the process is that you know you feel first you with the gut you acknowledge this is what is right because mm -hmm. the it's not gonna try to get <laughs> get over you or, or get beyond your senses right that's just the state of, of reality and then you process it with the heart based on the resonance or lack thereof or like kaidi once told me um uh you're probably familiar he was the original wo fat on hawaii 50 mm -hmm. uh, Brilliant man, a doctorate in theology, ran a, I was rector for a Tao sanctuary here in Tempe for a long time. But he'd said to me that, you know, it, it's either desirable or undesirable. And so viewing life in that situation kind of gets you in, into that gut place where you're feeling, it, it, it does this feel good or, or not? And so then by the time you get, you know, process it through the heart and you get into the head, then you make better choices because you've processed it in the right way. Right, you can be more sure of what the the choices that you make because they're true to you. Right, and and that's very important. You know, I talked about you know some of the lessons back to, and I took a look at because I was starting with the heart, you know, and the head, mm -hmm. and the more that you start realizing, because I took a look at my patterns. And yeah. what patterns continually would repeat themselves and how I continually, unfortunately, would get myself burned. It's like, how many times do you put your hand on a hot stove before you realize, you know, and so you start shifting your consciousness in relationship to how you evaluate things, which you said it very elegantly. In well, thank you. So, yeah. Um, I, I have a little practice. <laughs> 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 so... Back to the, the, the process of observing, and, and it's important you that you mentioned the patterns. Okay, as a cognitive scientist, that's what they do, is they recognize the patterns of the brain, and that's really what they are, right? The behavior happens because of the pattern thinking. Now, when you're observing your thoughts, how do you, uh, or how did you, because I'm sure you practiced this for a long time as well. How did you first recognize the stinking thinking? Well, one of the advantages that I happen to personally have, and I mentioned it to you earlier, I've been happily married for 37 years and my wife is brilliant. And mm. so I've got a sounding board and quite often she had a very loving way will point out when I've got stinking thinking, you know, one way or sure. the other. Um, and that mirror is all important. Yes, really. totally. So th that definitely helps when you've got the right sounding board. But if you don't have the sounding board, you've just got to, you know, quite often, you know, I don't look at myself as ever procrastinating, but there's, you know, if I'm making a decision, I need at least 24 hours to self-evaluate whatever I might be thinking about if it's of significance. I mean, sometimes- yeah, you Think about it, that, dream about it. That's meditate. another activity that we don't take advantage of because we don't know how. Yes. Right? Um, 
or maybe some do, right? There's a lot of dream theory people out there. Mm -hmm. um, and that is an advantage when you are able to um, at least be cognizant of the dreams that you have and, and not be too caught up in thinking that they're uh, um, in the moment thing because they're often you know reflective of multiple things in your life. Definitely, you know, paying attention. Yeah, and again, it's just becoming more conscious and aware. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and the more you're in tune with, you know, your complete self, the more that you're able to deal with the things that you've that are around you. And it doesn't. Yeah, I, I, I was <laughs> taking a breath and listening. You know, because what you said. You know, I was just breathing it in. Because it's very it's very true, and this is another thing that you know. In the uh, have you noticed the changes of breathing and your breathing or your breath patterns when you're in a place of flow as opposed to a place of um, disturbance or distraction? You know. Myself, personally, I seem to almost always be in that state of flow. Now, that doesn't mean, I, you know, as, have I noticed the breathing? No, but I notice I'm meditating more. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm spending more time, you know, sometimes, you know, I used to go fast, fast, fast. And even when I had to reinvent myself, now I'm sort of slowing down to go, you know, because I, I know where I'm going and everything I'm going to be in the process of doing, which part of what, you know, we talked about, I want to have the enlightened entrepreneur because as entrepreneurs, we all go through some sort of kind of darkness, so to speak, whatever that might be. Sure. Um, and it's how you continually focus on going to the light. Um, and, and I don't know, I don't exactly know what that's going to look like, but I know I'm going to attract the right people because it goes back to a consciousness shift and, a, you know, a, a having a more positive impact on humanity because um, I just believe our planet really needs that kind of an awakening. So, um, you know, we I do. Have and we have that possibility. Yes. Uh, the Kardashev scale, you know, was introduced decades ago and, and yet we've made some progress towards it. Um, Kardashev for, for those that are not familiar was Russian scientists that developed the, uh, a theory of uh, development of civilizations, a type one, type two, and type three is, is as far as he went. Type one is able to manage the planetary weather patterns and utilize the planet's energy uh, for energy use. So there's no manufactured energy at that point. It's all just gathered through wind, air, solar, um, geomancy, you know, all of those are thermal. Um, all of those kinds of things. And maybe even like Tesla's where we're able to, you know, pull it out of the air, which is quite possible and, and even uh, has been proven to work as well. So these are the kinds of things in developing communities that there's these, all these new technologies, both mental, psycho-spiritual, uh, te uh, technology, uh, material technologies and, and things like that, that haven't had the opportunity to, to be put in centralized locations to figure out how it works together. And I think that's part of what we're gonna experience in our movement towards this effort to be a, a, a type one. And I don't know that that's the necessarily conscious effort, that's the goal. It's the, the goal is learning how to work with each other and our planet and, and have healthy lifestyles and support one another. But where I see part of that goal happening is you've got different, when you're talking about technologies and, mm -hmm. and one, area I see it happening because we'll take a look at all these zoom calls and people are becoming more connected then you've got clubhouse I mean clubhouse is a little bit over a year a year out it's supposedly got a four billion dollar valuation it's got 20 million users already so you've got people that are connecting and you know the people that have got similarities and similar kinds of objectives I mean it's easier again to meet people in one aspect um, and I think a lot of because of that, it's going to accelerate the things that we're talking about actually happening. Absolutely. Uh, because the right people are getting together and they're going to focus on having the right intention mm -hmm. to help realize if we're going to survive as a species, as a planet, certain things have to change. 
you know, in one it's one just good sense. Of, yeah, exactly. I was gonna say one time a friend of mine he said five simple profound words, but it says if nothing changes, nothing changes. So we need change to happen, and it's happening. That's the key. It is it is happening, and it will accelerate happening because I I believe that more and more people are taking a look at a lot of the stuff that's happening in the world and saying, uh, going back to an old movie I watched, I think it was called The Networker. Uh, mm -hmm. he, a guy on radio broadcast, he's, he had everybody who was listening to the radio go to the go to the, the window in, in New York and yelled, I'm mad as hell and I ain't going to take it anymore. <laughs> and, and in reality, I think that's at some level what's, where humanity is coming now with all the politicians and you know how the Rothschilds and you know controlled everything with the banking system, and we don't even want to go down that hole. But it's shifting. The bottom line is, shift is happening. Well, and and for those that maybe weren't aware, um, you know, I've been privy to, to some really wonderful relationships, and, and um, one of them was with Jose Arguez. That you may be familiar with him. He brought out the Mayan calendar to mm -hmm. the Western world, and the the whole process uh, in one of the conversations i had with him but which was pretty lengthy where we were talking about the the process of change and, and that it isn't the end of the calendar it, it, it's the movement from one era to another and that's accompanied by a raise of uh, awareness and consciousness and pretty much parallel to the information curve up to um, you know the date the everybody's got to have a date right so the winter solstice of 2012 yep. was the apex for that now what happens uh after you hit the tipping point well you're going to take that awareness and, and consciousness back into wherever you are right and so the systems that you're working in are going to be affected by that and everything that doesn't fit is going to eventually rise to the surface and so that happens for the first maybe up to a decade afterwards, which is kind of where we're at now. It's come to a, a head with this great we set, right? And then uh, over time, that all changes because there's effort being made to do so. The other uh, point I wanted to make was that with, uh, th there was a book that was published back in 1964, it was called The New Science. And it was the memoirs of a guy named Wilbert Smith who ran Canada's UFO investigation uh, program called Project Magnet. It was funded by the Department of Transportation, so it was highly legit. But in his memoirs, he uh, admitted that he had some conversations with what he called people from elsewhere. And one yes. of the things they mentioned about time was that to them, it was a measurement of the change of entropy. Now, we believe that all systems will naturally decay into chaos. That's the theory of entropy. What if that's not true? What if the opposite is actually true and that time would, you know, uh, that our experience of time would be truncated as a result? V very, very interesting. <laughs> Isn't that? I, I mean, I, I ask all kinds of questions, right? I don't have the answers, but they're... they're valid questions based on that information there are definitely valid but you know you mentioned it's amazing you mentioned ufos because just two days three days ago i was looking at netflix and i put in my save list there's a documentary about ufos going way back to there i mean i only made it about halfway through but that's a you know a whole other piece now we're talking about the changes that are happening and one of the guys that i relate or mentioned earlier today was James Feldman, and I mentioned the word shift. And mm -hmm. his website is shifthappens.com, but he right. talks okay. about how- Yeah, I'm familiar with that one. I wasn't familiar with the name, but yeah. the website, I am, yeah, absolutely. He's an amazing, amazing person. I mean, I've had multiple conversations, somebody I look at as a friend, somebody that I just met like a year ago because of everything that's going on. If, if it wasn't because of these Zoom calls and you know things like that, our, our friendship probably might have never happened. Do you but, think that's hap that that's also happening because of a greater degree of, of resonance and attraction factor? 
you know, I, I believe that's the case. I mean, I take a look at the people that I'm connecting and attracting into my, you know, universe like yourself and myself. I mean, it's just another example. You know, we're coming together with the idea of sharing our perspectives and insights and wisdom to help other people hopefully see or understand or think think a little bit differently based mm -hmm. on the things that we've experienced. So, or at least giving them the choice to. Yes, exactly. Yeah, we can't, <laughs> can't make choices on information we don't know about. Yep, exactly. Um, so the uh, it's wonderful that in this process of um, coming into a new living awareness, if you will, you know, like you and I, you, you mentioned it just a few weeks ago, we really didn't need that. You know, we were connected, but we didn't know each other. Right. And, you know, you've got 30,000. I've got half that on LinkedIn. So how do we um, better utilize these kinds of connections in order to co-facilitate a, a shift? in thinking and acting? Well, part of it in, in, at one point, somebody says, it's not the number, it's the value you're bringing, mm -hmm. the, the quality you know, of those relationships. And so I'm shifting more now to figure out how can I be of more value? And that's why I like to do kinds of interviews, so to speak, or, or um, share, you know, get, you know, record things and digitize your information so that you can, uh, become more valuable to the people that you're connected with. And where do you see that potentially going in the short term? Well, in the short term, I, I'm looking at developing better relationships. In the long term, I'm looking at figuring out how by creating those kind of relationships, we're bringing the consciousness of the people that I'm that I'm we're attracting into our universe to make a positive shift in where where the humanity is going to you know ultimately go you okay. know that we need to all work together we are you know when God made us he all made us in his likeness you know and you know we're all connected as human beings it doesn't matter you know are we Asian you know are we people of color are we you know Caucasians whatever it doesn't matter you know, because we're all in God's likeness. Yep, yep, precisely. And uh, and as we were talking earlier, you know, the the experience of um, the NDE that I had being in the light and coming back, and, you know, I understood immediately that we are all cosmic consciousness condensed into form. And yep. I think that's really what Christ's message was. <laughs> we just weren't intelligent enough to really comprehend what that meant. But now with the science backing up the metaphysics, then it's much easier to acquiesce to that possibility rather than completely be in denial of it. Right. Plus, I think the human being is more open to listen mm -hmm. to this kind of information than they were in the past. Well, do you think it's by design? I mean, do you think that there's a this natural design within us that's on an evolutionary path, regardless of what we think about it? interesting question i never really thought about it but you know when you look at history and everything that's going on today um you know i think it's by necessity that we need to we need to shift that we need to come together if we're going to survive for the greater good of everything mm -hmm. you know uh, all this democrat republican going back and forth in the politics and all the other things i, I mean i think you know humans are getting to the point that they're pretty well fed up with it and they you know they're starting to realize how we've been manipulated so to speak precisely so uh, and some of that's self-manipulation but the majority of it is the programmed response that we're supposed to have through you know uh the advertising and marketing um it, across the board now here's an, another question um Given your comment about God and creation, things like that, why do you think we still insist on creating boundaries and borders and separations and things like that when, according to what the premise of, of 
you know, our relationship with God is there are no borders or boundaries. That's a human creation. And I, I got into a, a discussion on LinkedIn in, in, in a thread where I presented that question. And of course, I got a bunch of uh, not so good responses to it. And yet, if we're going to be one planet, we need to start considering, you know, that we do need to be caring and compassionate towards each other. And you can't do that with borders and boundaries. Well, and again, a border and boundary is just in your mind. And it's so that government, you know, you take a look at almost every war that's ever happened in the past. It's all based on property, gathering property. And in my mind, there are no boundaries. I mean, I sat back and made a list of the countries that I've gone to so far. And I've got 41 different countries that I've already gone to. Now, my wife would like to hit 70 different countries and she's been to I think 40 of the 41 you know by the time she's 70 which is getting coming close to you know we might have to shift that goal because of the pandemic because I'm not going to travel until we're on the other side of this pandemic sure you know you don't need to but I mean again I want to experience different cultures I want to meet people all around the world um, so boundaries to, in my mind happen in, happens in your mind. I mean, obviously when I, you know, cross a boundary, I've always got to put out my passport and I've got to do whatever I've got to do to sure. get into that boundary. But um, to me, I don't look at boundaries for the most part. I think it evolved being, uh, as we're growing into them, uh, would agree. And yet there's still the existing systems that are predicated on those boundaries and borders. And, and you know, even in America, I'm as much a patriot as anybody, if not more so, because I believe our country can lead the rest of the world in this transition. And we need to do that. It's even been um, in many places prophesied that we would. Um, I don't really care about that because it, it doesn't matter. What matters is what we do. Yep. And as long as we do it, then whatever else will be fulfilled, right? Um, how do you see the, the process of, um, well, then, let, let me get a little more practical. What's a great, and, and I'm gonna pull back here because we, we got really out there for a moment. What's the, what do you think are, uh, some of the best ways to interact with people online and the behaviors that are necessary in order to get the best results. Okay. The best way to, you know, the, the way I've learned the best way to practice with, with people online is be there of value, share insights, not coming across looking for a transaction. My whole objective when I meet somebody online is ultimately to get them offline so I can do a one-on-one -on -one or, you know, so I can really get to know them and then figure out how I can be of value or service to them. That's the biggest thing that I focus on. What can I do that will help you um, accelerate your success, move in the directions that you, that you really want to. And for me to do that, I need to understand where you are. For example, somebody once asked me, do I have a simple system um, to really help people? And the answer is no and yes. And the reason why it's no is, first of all, everybody's starting at a different place. Right. They everybody's an individual. Go, yeah, they want to go to someplace else. They're bringing different kinds of resources to the table. You sure. know, resources come in a variety of different forms. The reason why it's yes, I need to understand where they're starting, where they want to go, what their resources, what their level of commitment is. So to me, it's how can I understand you so I can be of value to you. Because again, if I can do something that's going to be positive and significant and impactful for you, it's going to create the relationship so that we've got a better chance of forming a long term relationship. Sure. I, um, and I agree with you that the no and yes kind of thing. I, I, as a transformational life coach is one of my uh, businesses and uh, I've been doing it for almost 20 years now. And one of the things that I developed was a survey. So it's like a 13 page survey that I get to everybody, right? Because yep. it gives me the opportunity then to see how they dig into themselves. 
by the, the way they answer the questions, the, the language that they use, the depth of understanding that they have of themselves, or the willingness to explore those areas. And so that kind of sets up, all right, now here's, here's the basic uh, foundation of the platform that we have to leap from. Yep. And then the rest of it is individually based because it's the individuals, right? Yes. And they have all kinds of different dreams and goals and things like that and uh, accomplishable, yep. you know? And, and like we're talking here, it, it's that most of the time, I find, as you've mentioned, it's a just a change in the way we think. Yep. What, one other thing that, the, that each individual has is they're bringing different baggage. And certain people are necessarily willing to release that baggage because it's holding them back. And for example, one of the people that I've been trying to coach, and I, you know, he always goes off into different tangents, and I keep letting him know, you got to stay on point. And it doesn't matter how many times yeah, I tell no it. carry on on this flight. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, it, it's a combination of different things because obviously in network marketing, at, at one level, when I've transitioned or transcended beyond network marketing, that's just one piece of what I do. Sure. Um, but you're, you're always coaching and helping people figure out how to make the changes necessary so that they can move or accelerate their success. Right. And network marketing traditionally has been that place where the confusion between transaction and relationship takes place. Yes. Yes. And that's shifting too. You know, we're talking about all the shifts that's going on based on certain things um, that are, that, that have been happening in the marketplace where it's now more about how do you introduce, how do you influence? I mean, life is how we influence people any way somebody wants to look at it as a coach, mm -hmm. as you know, one way or the other, you know, one way or the other. And for those people that program themselves, I don't want to sell, you know, you want to shift selling to the influence. And I'm sure you probably, and, and if you haven't come across Robert Cialdini's work uh, mm -hmm. called Influence and Pre-Persuasion. In fact, he, he was a professor at ASU, which, uh, you know, right around the corner from you, but it's right. like, it's like the Bible for anybody that's in the field of influence, but life is how we influence people. It truly is. And how we are influenced by them. Yes. Too, Understanding it is, how we're influenced by them. Yeah, it, It's a shared experience. Uh, the whole, you know, uh, man is not an island unto himself. Because um, that island is actually connected to the earth regardless of how it appears with uh, you know it's like the tip of the iceberg kind of thing um so in consideration of this process we're in what might you offer as a personal advice in potentially global and specific um way that our listeners could maybe explore this ability to change within themselves. One of the pieces of advice, one of my first direct mentors gave me because in my mind, I knew where I was and where I wanted to be and I wanted to be there faster. So he would always say to me, attitude of gratitude, be grateful for where you are as you're going to where you deserve to be. You know, we all deserve, I mean, obviously, no matter what we think, you know, we deserve to create the things that we truly think about, you know, in a positive, in a positive realm to have, mm -hmm. but there's a process that we go through. And, and so you've got to enjoy the process. The attitude of gratitude was very instrumental because again, we live in an instant society and I wanted it now. But now <laughs> Look, enlightenment, quick, right? <laughs> You know, I, was, I had fun with that phrase for a while. Everybody wants, you know, they want the drive through enlightenment, you know, order it and pick it up. Um, now, on, do you have a daily practice? Is there the, the attitude of gratitude? I totally uh, honor that and have it as well. Um, is it something that you start and end the day with or? Uh, is it a process, you know, whether it's a prayer, a ritual, or, or just an acknowledgement? 
Yeah, as far as a daily practice, there's certain things that I always like to incorporate into my daily practices. Part of it is meditation, part of it is walking, where I've had the opportunity to, you know, get out and just uh, enjoy the fresh air, exercise. Mm -hmm. um, another part of it is connect with human beings because as a networker, as a professional networker, um, you know, and got to have it. Yeah, you, you got to have it. In fact, somebody, as I tell people, I'm a professional networker strategist. They say, well, how do you make any money? Because I never charge. You know, I, I believe I got to, you know, I, my belief is I want to give so that I can develop the long-term relationship. But through that, I became a CMO of a company that also part owner because of the value that I brought. You know, so I've, what I've learned, the more value you get, opportunities open themselves up. And what we do is get um, uh, paying customers for coaches as long as they've got a funnel and or uh, email list so that we can farm one or the other for them at no cost. We just take a percentage. So to me, I like to connect with people. And then obviously being married for 37 years, I want to make sure I connect with my wife, <laughs> you know, because that way, sure. you know, she, you know, so, I mean, I, I have daily practices that I do every single day. Um, mm -hmm. So. Awesome. Um, is there any other kind of tasty tidbit that this has stirred in you? Yeah, you know, the, 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 one of the tidbits, because, you know, as we're looking at different people that we interact with, and sometimes people do things that are outside of what we believe are, are right one way or the other. And there was a saying that I heard, learned a long time ago. A person's character is like a tea bag. You never know what's inside of it until it gets into hot water. You know, we talk about looking at the signs, and, and unfortunately, most of us miss the signs and as I tell people that and I ask people a question after I've mentioned that and my question is what color are yield signs simple question mm -hmm. so what color are yield signs they're yellow they haven't been yellow in over 40 years when you drive by them the next time you'll see they're red and white how many have you gone by so as we deal with people oh yeah I, well I come from Okay, interesting. You can Google it. I'm just saying. Thank you. you know, yeah. we, we drive by them. I can tell you why people think that, because they're thinking of yield the stop signs, and they're yield the yellow on this the, on that. But in the meantime, again, it's paying attention. That's what right. we talked about. Paying Got me on that one, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> don't feel bad. At almost everybody. I don't mind being got. Trust me. <laughs> Yeah, almost everybody falls through the same thing. But the point is, you know, there's signs all around us. Absolutely. In relationship to everything that we're doing. And it's becoming more conscious and aware of those signs. Well, the synchronicities, the, that, that's one thing around you. Just being aware of uh, how you know, the universe speaks. God, whatever you want to call it, speaks all the time. We just aren't able to listen well because we're not quiet enough. We're thinking about stuff. And as long as we're thinking, we're not listening. Or we're caught up in survival or caught up in the little things. Yes. You know, rather than being focused on the bigger things of how we can make a positive impact on humanity. Right. Cool. Robert, it's been a real pleasure having you um, in this conversation today. It, it was uh, unexpectedly uh, pleasurable. And I like that. <laughs> I do too. It was great. I look forward and I'd love to get a recording when it's, when you get it. Uh, I'll, I'll have it to you shortly. Yeah, Thank you so it. much. And namaste and in la catch. Thank you for listening and watching this episode of One World in the New World. I'm Zen Benefil, your host, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>